Thank you, Terry, and everyone who organized this event. This is really fantastic. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth. I'm here uh, on behalf of Public Citizen. I'm working with them to coordinate the People Over Pentagon Campaign Coalition. Um, and I want to tell you all about the work we're doing. And I also want to tell you three reasons why I'm really excited about what we're doing. And, I, and it gives me hope. So I will do my best to inject some hope and then this afternoon we're gonna learn from people who are way smarter than I am about all, all the solutions and where we go from here. Uh, so I will say I'm gonna speak in pretty political terms because that's what this project is and also I don't think we can separate our challenges or our solutions from politics. Um, and also no one gets left off the hook when we talk about this issue. Um, everybody needs pressure, even our champions, even uh, those who we might regularly disagree with, they, they get our pressure too. Everybody uh, is on the table who needs some pressure and needs to hear from us on this issue. So just to cover for everyone what the People Over Pentagon campaign is. Uh, so this came together and Bill was actually very instrumental in helping put it together even before I came on board, but the origin was out of just frustration with this last set of budget negotiations between he who shall not be named in the White House and this newly elected Democratic-led House of Representatives. So the way that went was 45, I guess we'll say, said, May I have $750 billion for the military? And of course, our resistance leaders in the House said, absolutely, you may not. You can have $750 next year, but you can only have $738 this year. That was the wild counteroffer from the Democratic leaders in the House. That's where we are on this issue, that we're playing around the margins of a system that has just inherently been set up to favor the defense contractors, endless war, an economy of militarism. So that's where this came from, was just frustration. Like, what are we doing here? This narrative is not gonna work anymore. So more than 20 progressive-leaning national organizations came together to sign on to a statement that called for 2020 candidates, those who are running for president, to include in their campaigns specific plans to cut at least $200 billion a year from the Pentagon and to reinvest it in literally anything else. That's it, that's the agenda. That's what we're doing. So all of these organizations came together, signed on to this statement, made it public, got some great press coverage, sent it out to all the campaigns, and so what we've been doing now is we've been talking to the campaigns. We've been briefing them, we've been having conversations, we've been pushing them, we've been helping to educate them. And now we're moving into a phase where uh, we're doing a lot of uh, more public, we're, we're feeding the narrative, we're getting more voices out there. And we're publishing op-eds, we're organizing people in a grassroots way. Um, so, you know, this is a really exciting initiative. I like the focus of it. I like the group we're working with. And so I, I want to go on to tell you three reasons why I'm especially excited about this. So the first one I've kind of already gotten into, which is that sort of by definition of our agenda here, we are just rejecting the frame that both Republicans and Democrats have set up for us all these years. Our folks here, who is familiar with the, the term Parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y. Yeah, most of us, right? So this is a term that Congress has been working under. It's, it's a, a framework that came out in 2011 in the Budget Control Act. So long ago, it feels like when uh, Republicans threatened shutdown of the entire government, if there wasn't this major deal that was struck on deficit spending and oh no, what will we do? Um, and this was the sort of Obama era solution was the sequester, right? Where defense spending is at this level and everything else is at this level and you can't raise one without the other, or at least that was the idea. And what that's meant 
of course, we're going to kind of set aside that, like, somehow we always get around the caps on the, the defense spending, right? We've got the overseas contingencies operations, slush fund, we've got all these loopholes that always seems to find money every single time. But what it's looked like is that progressives have found themselves buying into this framework where they're not really challenging the levels of defense spending because they're scared they won't be able to increase any other spending. So people who are pushing for more money for healthcare, for education, for protecting the environment, for food, for nutrition services, all these things, infrastructure, everything that we depend on other than the military, it's like you've got to ask for an increase in defense spending if you're gonna get that. It's so silly, like why are we doing this? So it's an outdated concept. It's something that now procedurally at least is kind of falling by the wayside. But it's amazing to me, you know, I've been, this, Terry mentioned a little bit about my background. I've been working in Washington a little bit on these issues and it is so baked into even progressive leaning people's ideas. Well, you know, the, the, the best thing we can really fight for, and this is sort of what, you know, this was the progressive position in this last budget negotiation was, we're going to ask that all the non-defense spending match the defense spending this year. Like, that's the wild progressive idea. So what I really like about this campaign is we are just throwing that aside. We're coming at it from the perspective that we should just ask for what we want. And we should just fund our values. And there's, for me, there's such a moral component to this, right? Like, it's even a biblical, I grew up. Southern Baptist and uh, have it very deeply in my bones, but it, this idea that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also, right? And so if we look at our budget and we look at what we're funding, if it's a statement of our values, if it's a statement of where our treasure and where our heart is, it doesn't look good. So what we're trying to do as a campaign is we are setting aside that false paradigm and we're asking to completely rethink the conversation. You know, this is an election cycle of big ideas, right? It's amazing to me in just such a small amount of time the ideas that are viable and are on the table that candidates are talking about and grassroots activists are fighting for. Green New Deal, Medicare for All, free college. There's all kinds of big things that even just a few years ago people were afraid to talk about, but they're here now. So what we're trying to suggest is that in a moment of big ideas, let's present a big idea of our own. And that actually leads me to the second reason I'm really excited to be working on this campaign. It's because of the diversity of our coalition. So I will say that I think that one of the keys to our success as a movement, when I say our, I mean all of you, all of us, is I think we have to stop thinking about this issue as its own issue. This issue is every other issue, too. We're not going to have a slash in Pentagon spending if we don't completely disrupt the cycles. We just heard from Bill how much this is baked into our economy and from Jeff also, who, who got into the economics of it. But we've got to completely disrupt the way we do business in this country if we're going to slash Pentagon spending. And it impacts immigration, it impacts climate, it impacts racial justice, it impacts health care, it impacts education. It's not just its own thing. And yes, it's about ending endless wars, but it's about making our choices about what we're going to fund, what our priorities are. And that requires a lot of different people to be at the table. So I'm really excited. We have at the table United We Dream, who are super, super leaders in immigrant rights movements. We have climate justice organizations. Um, we have folks focusing on racial justice. We have people who are more traditional peace groups. Um, we have multi-issue progressive organizations like my former team at Indivisible, Move On, Center for Pop uh, Popular Democracy, Democracy for America. They're all in this coalition. So we're all working together and trying to say this is a progressive issue and it is absolutely essential if we're going to win on all these other things. Because, you know, I believe really deep down, and, and I think that it is really core to our success here, that we are just not going to win on any of these things if we don't move from an economy that depends on a state of war and reliance on fossil fuels into a 
green peace economy. That has to happen. And so those who are working for a Green New Deal, those who are thinking about these big imaginative things that, that cost money, guess where we can pull some money from? There's a whole Pentagon budget with lots of it. So I'm really excited about that. So the third thing is our strategy is actually pretty narrow. We are focusing on the 2020 candidates. That's it. We want them to start talking about this. We want them to roll it into their plan. We want them to get asked about it. Uh, we want them to bring it into the conversation. And the reason for that is because we're recognizing right now a lack of real champions in Congress. And, and I should say there are tons of groups doing amazing work to keep pressure in Congress, and that is important. And they don't get let off the hook either. Remember, that was my, one of my roles. No one gets left off the hook here. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. What we want to do is we want to change the subject of the conversation and we want to move it from where it is into a completely different place. And the reality is, you all live in the US just like I do. All anybody's talking about is 2020 right now, right? When one candidate says something, the other ones have to respond. When one puts out what seems like a crazy idea, the other ones have to match. That's where the conversation is now and that's how we change our ideas of what's possible. So that's what we're focusing on, is trying to get 2020 candidates to really build this into what they think it means to be a progressive and what they think it means to win, um, because that's how we all win as well. And on my note about no one gets let off the hook, a couple of examples, you know, we're, we're tracking all this really closely. Um, a couple of candidates, so, well, I should say in general, actually quite a few candidates are talking about cutting the Pentagon budget, and that's really great. Um, so, but a couple of candidates who have put out much more in-depth plans are Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. Um, Elizabeth Warren, of course, put out this really comprehensive idea about tackling the military-industrial complex, combating corruption uh, within the defense industry. And at a national level, she's been really terrific on that. But Elizabeth Warren fought really hard to keep Raytheon projects in Massachusetts as a senator. And Bernie Sanders, who has talked about the Green New Deal necessarily must include reducing military spending. He has been truly a real champion on a lot of this stuff. He fought to keep some, uh, I think it was the F-35 in Vermont. Uh, so I think what that tells us, right, is that this is how deep that influence goes. This is how deep economies depend on war manufacturing and, and fossil fuel reliance. Um, and that is the system in which we are working. And so that's why while running for president, each of these people has an opportunity to flip that conversation. And if they get elected, they've got a lot of power to help move that needle and change those top lines. So before I close up here, I'll just highlight a few ways where maybe some of us can work together here. Um, I do encourage you, please go to peopleoverpentagon.org. That's peopleoverpentagon.org. Um, you can see the list of organizations that are signed on. Um, you can take a look at the letters that we're sending to the candidates. We're hoping soon. We've got some social media stuff there that you can use. Um, we're hoping soon we're going to have some more resources and, and all kinds of things there. And we're continuing to populate it as we post op-eds and we have all kinds of things coming out. So please go there. There's also a place there where you can um, uh, send us a message. It actually goes straight to me. So if you send us a message to the website, I will see it. Um, but what we need really, so any of you who represent a state, local organization um, are welcome to sign on as an endorser. Um, we, that's a great thing, we welcome that. But the real thing we need are just more voices out here. Um, the, the pro of all of us from the 20 organizations who are doing this is that we are in DC, we're able to um, you know, kind of work at a national level with some of the campaigns and some of the national media, but like, to candidates that means nothing. They care about, look, DC, no, but no, nobody's coming to come get the DC votes. Our votes don't count, okay? They barely count. We'll talk about DC statehood another time. But, uh, but, but, but candidates want to hear from you all, from people who live outside DC, people who are in early primary states, people just in general. So what we're really interested in is more people publishing op-eds, letters to the editor, 
um, you know, in their student publications, on social media, just raising this up and saying, yeah, actually, me too, I also want to know, are you willing to cut at least $200 billion a year from the Pentagon budget in order to fund our other priorities? And you can ask them, in order to fund a Green New Deal, in order to fund Medicare for All, in order to fund whatever your big priority is, are you willing to cut at least $200 billion a year from the Pentagon budget to accomplish that goal? And that's the question we want to ask. And the reason that that's it, I will say, you know, we are kind of less concerned about the actual number, but the reason we ask them about a number is we don't want waffling, we don't want like, oh yeah, 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 let's cut the Pentagon budget, that sounds good, right? No, we want to hear specifically how much, how committed are you to this? People going to town halls, candidates who are coming to events, people showing up and asking that question. So if you all, if people you know, are able to do some of those things to get this question in front of candidates, send me a message to people over Pentagon website. We have a lot of resources at our disposal. We can help, we can support, we can amplify it over social media, and we can keep creating that echo chamber that's asking for something different. So um, I'm actually going to close it up there, um, and I am just going to say that uh, overall, this is not really fourth category, but the approach that I really love about this campaign, what you all are doing, what we all are doing together, is I think we all recognize that the time for kind of working incrementally around the margins just like we're past that. It's not gonna work anymore. We don't wanna ask for permission. We don't wanna take it step by step. We just wanna start doing that. And I think it's a lot like, uh, you know, I, I have this quote everywhere, but Gandhi and his organizing always said, there is no path to peace. Peace is the path. Um, well, I think it might be hard to make lobbying illegal outright, but there's a lot to be done to rein it in. First of all, taking money out of politics uh, so that these folks don't have such a huge advantage. Um, second of all, uh, groups like Project and Government Oversight, which is all over this kind of issue, um, have talked about you know, once somebody leaves the Pentagon, they have to have a cooling off period of at least five years before they can go into industry. There's got to be disclosure of who these folks are that are doing this. And the idea is it'll, you know, if they have to wait five years, their contacts will be cooler. They'll uh, perhaps get involved in some constructive activity and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, things like that, I think, could be done. Um, I think if every possible meeting were open, I think that would be great. I mean, some of the best things we found out is when people have covertly, um, you know, uh, taped uh, fundraising events, like you know Mitt Romney and the forty-seven percent of people who just want to live off the dole and that kind of thing. Um, so why not force them to be on the record all the time? You know, I mean, they are running for public office. I think that's a, that's a reasonable request. Um, and then there's all kinds of transparency issues in terms of uh, documents we should have about the budget, about what the intelligence community is up to. Uh, you know, it comes to the surface with things like this whistleblower complaint against President Trump that they're trying to hold on to. So I think the more open the government, the better. And, and there's groups like uh, POGO, Project and Government Oversight, that are pushing hard on that, uh, as well as a number of others. So. Um, I think it's, you know, in order to change that, the end result, we also have to change the process of how our government works. I think that's a lot of what you're getting at. I, I would just add to that, um, I, I probably should disclose, like, I, I'm, I'm a registered lobbyist. <laughs> like, I, I'm in the pocket of big peace. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, I, yeah I, I actually don't think lobbying is bad. I think that, I think, like, unethical conduct and bribery is bad. And, and I think that um, people persuading the government to change things, um, I think all, all of you are lobbyists. And, and like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing that I think needs to be reclaimed as, as like, influence is good. Undo influence and corrupt influence is what's bad. And so I think a, a number of the things you mentioned also, I, I, to me, I do want to tie it back to this is why... Pentagon spending bleeds into every other issue, and and I will give um, the new Democratic leadership like 
some kudos for they rightly recognize that the public mood is very there right now on um, anti-corruption measures, pro-democracy reform things. They made it HR 1, the first bill in the new Democratic House this year with a huge package of um, lobbying restrictions and voting rights and transparency and ethics and anti-corruption. I think what they don't realize is that necessarily will hit the defense industry, which is the source of so much of that. So. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, I think just exactly what you're saying is that the money and politics issue, like it is not its own thing, and Pentagon spending is not its own thing. They are necessarily intertwined, and that's why we've got to tackle these things together in coalition. Um, and public citizen, I should say, is doing like phenomenal democracy reform work on that. Part of the reason we chose to name this campaign people over Pentagon is recognizing that there are people who are harmed by big Pentagon spending and some of those people are in the military and are people who are caught up in, in fighting and coming home from war and that sort of thing and there's this, I think one of the challenges we're working against is this public misconception that we can't cut the Pentagon because that means cutting money for troops and military families and that's not really where that money's going. Like they're actually also their their human needs are getting shorted because of big militarism that disproportionately impacts big corporations over the people. So I, yeah. Uh, yeah, just to reinforce that out of the seven hundred plus billion for the Pentagon, three to four hundred billion of it every year goes straight out the door to corporations like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics. Raytheon and so forth, Boeing. Um, so this notion that you know the budget is for the troops is just a crock. You know, uh, likewise, you know Trump's going to pay for the wall out uh, of Pentagon money, which is outrageous in its own right. But where is he going to get the money? He's taking it from daycare centers and military bases. He's taking it from rebuilding Puerto Rico. He's taking it from the most vulnerable people. He's not taking it to say, oh, let's buy one. Instead of buying 78 F-35s, let's buy 77 this year. Because Lockheed Martin wouldn't stand for it. So I think there's that. And then you know, you've got the Veterans Administration, which has at least tripled since our wars, I mean, the, the budget uh, since the wars of this century. But of course, it's not well organized. It's slow. It's not getting the help to people when they need it. Um, but I agree that we got the government's got to get its act together. You know, if you're, you're going to send somebody to risk their lives, you better take care of them when they come home. Um. The sentence, the Pentagon, spend, the Pentagon budget is too large, is an incomplete sentence. And that there's got to be more after that. The Pentagon budget is too large because what? And so what? And I think that's exactly what you're getting at, is that the, the, much of the root cause of this starts to me at the question of what do we think the actual threats and the challenges are that face the security of the United States. Um, and I do want to recommend a new report that just came out this week from Win Without War, um, and they're in our People Over Pentagon Coalition, but it, it, it gets to this exact thing and it suggests, um, and they're not the only ones saying this, lots of people are picking up that like, if we're being realistic, is I know this is kind of a controversial statement, but is terrorism really a threat to the security of the United States? Like, if we're looking statistically, uh, no, right? Like, not really. Um, not in terms of, right, it's something like since 9-11, like, less than 100 Americans have, have died in any sort of violence connected with um, terrorism. And to his credit, uh, you know, Obama at one time, like, put something in a speech saying, like, more people have died from a vending machine falling over on top of them than... Um, then, in, then an act of terror, and then he got like clobbered for it, and then it backed away, and thus the Obama administration. But um, uh, anyway, but like this is the point, right? Is like let's be realistic and clear-eyed about threats. Um, it's not to say that there is no problem with terrorism. Of course there is. It's not to say that there aren't security challenges. Of course there are. But it's being realistic about them and not buying into overinflation and overhyped ideas of threats. Um, there's a school of thought that is growing more and more that climate change is a much bigger threat to everyone's life. Um, so there's all, so many things, mass inequality, right? Like the, the, the problems that we have here at home with being healthy and prosperous and secure. So 
Um, the, the whole point there, and like One Without War's new report does a great job at, at tying it back into the budget question, is if we are realistic about what poses a threat to our security, then we have to recognize that there really aren't military solutions to those challenges. And so we've got to invest in different tools accordingly. Uh, yeah, just what she said. Um, but I think, you know, there is a, the, the challenge is that there's the facts and, and there's the psychological hold that fear has on people. Um, you know, so uh, the New America Foundation did a study showing that, um, you know, since 911, the vast, vast majority of terrorist attacks, small as they are, in the United States were from individuals who were motivated by that ideology, not, you know, foreign terrorist organizations that infiltrated our, our country. Um, so there's, there's that element. Um, I think people need to, I think you have to combat fear with hope. People need to feel like there's other ways to solve these problems. You know, for example, the nuclear deal with Iran, which curbed their nuclear program for the foreseeable future, um, was a potential building block to reduce tensions in the Middle East. This administration abandoned that deal, and look where we are now. We're on the verge of war. Um, you know, so uh, I think part of it is need, people need to feel that diplomacy can work. Um, the New York Times had one of these, you know, tired old kind of headlines, uh, maybe yesterday, uh, basically saying, you know, the fact that Trump, not just the Times, but the sources they used, um, the fact that Trump has struck back after the strike on the Saudi oil fields calls into question the United States' willingness to guarantee the security of our allies in the Gulf. And so essentially they're saying, you know, if you don't kill somebody, you're not serious about defending your allies. And the truth of the matter is if we want to defend our allies, we have to ratchet down the tensions in that region. Because if there's a war with Iran, Saudi Arabia is not going to be unscathed. United Arab Emirates, all those nice skyscrapers are going to disappear. Um, you know, so, and even some of these countries acknowledge that UAE has pulled back a bit from its war mongering rhetoric, has opened a channel of communications with Iran because they've realized that a war is not in their interest. So I think somehow I have to keep hammering on uh, both the facts and the fact that there are other ways to solve the problem. And I think it's going to be a challenge because it's almost like a conditioned reaction. Uh, and politicians of both parties turn to it when they need support, uh, when they need to distract us from other problems, uh, and so forth. But I think we just have to um, uh, push back as, as hard and in as many ways as we can. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's it's foundational to to what we're dealing with. 